Hello, my name is Rob Garner. I'm a computer programming instructor, and today I'm going to demonstrate how to use abstract and sealed classes in C Sharp. So I'm going to open up this starter project. And in this project, we have a employee class that has a few properties, um, a paste summary property here, and then an overridden two-string method. And uh, we have an hourly employee that inherits from this employee class. So right now we are just using regular inheritance to implement this. And we can see that our hourly employee inherits from the employee class. So one thing that would make this situation better would probably be though that to have our employee class not be something that can be instantiated. If you think about it, an hour, hourly employee makes sense as something that you can instantiate because it actually has a, some pay. This employee class is really something um, that ought to be abstract because we would never anticipate instantiating just a generic employee. So we have a keyword in C sharp called abstract. This virtual method that's pay summary, you know, to have this uh, statement here, no pay for base class employee really doesn't make much sense. So the nice thing about making a class abstract is we don't have to define things that don't make sense. And the way we do that is in this case, I'm just going to declare this property um, this way, which means I'm not actually providing an implementation for this get part of this this pay summary property, and, and I'm going to define it as abstract. And then to add a little bit to this uh, class, I'm going to add a list of hours that this employee would presumably have worked because that's something that all employees would do. And then a We'll provide uh, a property to get access to that as well. And then we'll also provide a method, an abstract method that will be able to provide a start and end date to and uh, will return a decimal result, which will be what the person's pay is between a start and end period. So notice that the abstract method here is we have a function prototype, but we don't have an actual function definition for a block of code below it. So normally, for example, if this was a concrete uh, method, you would start writing some code here. But when you're defining an abstract method, uh, you just provide the function prototype. And sometimes this is referred to as a contract. Basically, what an abstract uh, method in, an, in, an, in a class means is that any class that implements employee must implement all the abstract methods or itself be declared abstract. So for class to be concrete and not abstract, it must implement all the abstract methods in any abstract class that the class inherits. Now, 
over here, our hourly employee, you see we now have an error. It says hourly employee does not implement inherited abstract member employee.pay. And, uh, uh, and so that makes sense. We have this pay method, which is abstract, hourly employee inherits from employee, and therefore it must implement all the abstract methods. So one way is I could start writing, um, you'll notice in the error here that uh, it has a show potential fixes option. You can click on that or hit control dot. And it gives you the option to let uh, Visual Studio implement the abstract class. So I'm going to do that. And you'll see that it will write this abstract It'll stub out this abstract method. I'm going to just move it up here so it's easier to see. And so now the uh, error next to hourly employee goes away and we see um, we have this stubbed out method. When it stubs it out, it just throws a uh, not implemented exception until you Put in what you want. So how do we figure out a pay for our employee? Well, what we can do is um, let's declare, declare a double for a variable we'll accumulate hours into. And we'll just uh, f do a for loop that goes from uh, start to end. And we'll use the accumulation addition operator to bring in the hours and um, we'll convert that so this will total the number of hours that the employee worked between these two pay periods and then we'll just multiply by the hourly rate uh, to get uh, the total pay. I'm converting it to decimal because um, hours is a uh, double, and when you multiply double by a decimal, you'll get back a double, and so we'll have to convert it back to a decimal in order to return it. So in program let's uh, see if we what we can instantiate let's um, let's see if we can instantiate an employee notice that we can't instantiate just a regular employee and if you look at the error could cannot create an instance of the abstract class or interface employee and that makes sense an abstract class is not instantiable it is really just a contract saying if you want to be an employee, uh, you get the following properties and methods for free, and you have to implement these abstract methods, and you also get uh, this free override. So now what we need to do, but, so we can't instantiate them, but we can instantiate an hourly employee. And that's because the hourly employee has, is not abstract. It's a fully concrete class that can be implemented. And we can set some properties.
and we'll add some hours just to have some hours added. And um, let's uh, write out a few things. Um, So we'll use the pay summary here. Oh, it's actually a property, so we don't need the parentheses here. And now we'll call our pay method and we'll pass in the start and the end. And uh, since pay returns a decimal, I'm going to two string it and display as currency. And let's see what happens. I'll hit Control F5. And we see this works. We have, uh, we instantiated an hourly employee. And it gives us uh, the information. So let's add another class. And this time I'm going to make a salary class. And we're going to inherit from employee. I need to change my namespaces to match. I changed the name of this project. So I'm going to change it to match my project name so that it's the same namespace throughout. The
And uh, so now we have a salary employee inheriting from a sal or an from the employee class. And again, we can see that a salary employee needs to implement the abstract member pay and pay summary. The reason why this is powerful is uh, um, by having this contract, we can guarantee that all the derived classes have these methods. And this will be important later on. So I'm going to let uh, Visual Studio implement uh, or stub out those the, the overridden property and the method. And uh, we'll write the rest of this class. So our salaried employee needs a salary. So we'll make a um, a salary property. And we're going to change the, uh, well, before we do that, let's, uh, let's finish implementing pay summary and pay. And so for pay summary, I'm just going to return So let's look at this pay method. So unlike the the hourly employee, we don't get the pay for a salaried employee by just multiplying hours. So we're going to define um, uh, for for our salary employee. There's 24 pay periods per year, two per month, say, and then. What we'll do is uh, we'll say pay is equal to salary times, and then we can just take the end minus the start, which will give us the total number of pay periods, and divide it by pay periods per year, and just return pay. Now, obviously, there's more complexity to building uh, pay. Uh, salaried employees probably would, actually. Uh, we would look at the hours and see if there's overtime but uh, for sake of this demo, we're just going to keep it kind of simple. And then I'm going to override the two string. And uh, we're just going to take the uh, base class two string and just add salary employee at the end. And as a reminder, uh, you know, the uh, call it using the base keyword allows you to access members of the base class. In fact, if I hit this dot, you can see um, we can get employee number, first name, and any of the methods from base. And so that's that's a useful keyword if you need to access the base class, uh, the members of the base class. I also want to override, uh, let's see, we've got the pay summary, we've got the pay. String. I think that's, yes, that's everything we need. So I'm going to save this and go back to our program. So now we have a salary employee. Again, I need to make sure everything's in the same namespace. So we've got an hourly employee. Let's kind of use the same code to, to create a salary employee. No salary employee doesn't have an hourly rate. Instead, they would have a salary.
And we do have hours for the employee, but obviously this isn't used uh, at this stage. And so we'll display information for the hourly employee and then and then also uh, the salary employee. So let's see what this looks like. And so now we've got two classes and they appear to be working. So I'm going to do a few things. One, uh, I'm going to uh, refactor this part of uh, the code into a um, um, into a display method. Uh, there's a convenient way of doing this in Visual Studio. You can hit a control dot and extract method. And you can see here, it shows you what the method will look like. You take in an employee and then display uh, the information. So I'm going to first extract that method. And I'm going to call this uh, display employee info. And right now, we're passing in an hourly employee when I refactor that. But let's say we want to also use this method to also be able to apply it to a salaried employee. Well, rather than writing another display inf employee info method, what we could do is we could say, hey, uh, since the things we're displaying here are common to the employee class, let's just make this so that it takes an employee. And what I've done is, um, by the way, the way I did that, if you're wondering, is you can rename by hitting control R twice and then uh, um, and it's a nice convenient way of renaming everything and so here we now have uh, a, uh, a method to write it write the right information and I'm going to kind of clean this up a little bit and let's maybe we'll we'll do is we'll also just write the name at the top. And we know that all employees have a first name and last name. So we can safely in this method which takes an employee use the first and last name. And so now that I've done that, I don't need to write this code twice. I can just use the display employee info and I can pass in an hourly employee and a salary employee. So here's where the power of, of uh, using um, polymorphism comes in. Because the hourly employee in, inherits from employee and the salary employee also inherits from employee, and because the employee class guarantees that, first off, the employee will have a first and last name, and have hours, and also requires any inherited, inheriting classes to define a pay and pay summary method. We can therefore write a method that takes an employee as an argument or as a parameter, and we can pass either a hourly employee or a salary employee in as an argument. And because of this, these abstract methods, we can with confidence know that we will have a pay summary 
and we will also have the pay method. And the result is that we only have to write this display method once and we can pass in any type of employee and this function will work. This is in fact polymorphism. The idea that while I'm passing in an object of, of one type into the method, it, it polymorphs into a class of another type. In this case, ch child classes can be passed in and become and be used as a parent class object. Another concept that comes in here is Lipskov substitution principle, which basically states that any child class object should be substitutable for a parent class object. And so we have to be careful when we write our employee and salary employee class that we don't do anything that breaks this paradigm. For example, our pay method needs to behave the same across all of our classes in order for us to reliably use it polymorphically. So let's give this a try and see if this works. And yes, it does work. We're able to use the salary class and the employee class in the display method, passing it into a, a method that you has a parameter that is a, of the parent class. So these are the child these are implemented the child classes, hourly and salary employee, but they can be passed in to a parameter that is of the parent class. So let's clean up this code here. You know, the this is seems to work okay, but it would be nice to have some constructors. Perhaps we would like to automate this employee number process because here I just made two employees with the same number. So I'm going to go to my employee class and let's say we did this. We, um, we created a private static integer. We're gonna call last employee number. And the reason why I'm making this private and static is I wanna keep track of the last employee number used in this class. And um, so the reason why I'm doing this is I want to keep track of the last employee used by this class. I'm making this field static so that there's only one that exists for each, for all instances in this class. And, um, and I'm making it private and an integer as well. Um, and then I'm going to add a constructor here. I'm just going to put it at the top. And we're going to say employee number is equal to last employee number and um, we'll increment it. So what does this do? Well, when I instantiate, every time I instantiate, maybe it makes it clear if I put this up here so that, so this private static variable belongs to the class as a whole. This constructor gets called every time you instantiate an instance of this, of this employee class. And what this behavior will do is every time you instantiate an employee, it will take the, it will look at the last employee number and assign it into employee number. So this gets set automatically. In fact, since we want this behavior to be automated, we're going to make the set private in the employee number property. This will increment the instance of the employee. In addition, this we have last employee number post incremented, which means that after last employee is assigned into imp number, this plus plus will act after the assignment operation, which will then change last employee number in the class. Now you would say, well, hey, every time you run this program, this gets reset to zero. And there would be ways you could automate that by uh, uh, using a static constructor to, to, to set that to whatever the last instance was. But that would, at this stage, we'd probably be using a file or a database to store it. And in actuality, 
uh, if you were using a database, this would be done automatically. But I'm just using this as an, a way of, of showing how you can um, uh, use some of these interesting features of, uh, of inheritance and polymorphism. And now since this is done automatically, if we look at program.cs, we can see it says, hey, uh, your get's private. You can't do this. So now we don't need to use this code anymore because our employee will automatically set the, um, the employee ID and we'll increment it automatically. So uh, that could be an interesting way possibly of incrementing, uh, of setting one of our, our attributes of our class and uh, would ensure that uh, this makes a unique ID for our employee. And you may say, well, how did hourly employee and salary employee get that? Well, both of these inherit from employee. We provided this behavior inside of the employee class, and therefore, everything automatically inherits from it. So what you notice here is we made a pretty important change to the way our class behaves, and we didn't have to change both salary and hourly employee. Uh, this is a good implementation of the concept of dry. Don't repeat yourself. You want the things that are common to all employees in the abstract employee class, and then only the things that are unique to uh, in our, our derived classes in those derived classes. So I'm going to continue on and uh, um, add some constructors to uh, the to my drive classes and uh, we'll do one that sets the salary for to maybe s some sort of default and in the hourly employee one one that um, Defaults uh, hourly rate. Oh, we already have that here. And uh, let's add um, some over an overridden constructor. Actually, let's say we want to um, have an overridden constructor. So I'm going to go to the employee class and I'm, and a common thing that we might want between both, uh, both of our, our, our employee types is uh, uh, maybe we would like to, um, to have a constructor that you can use to set the first and last name. And uh, why would we, want to uh, write this twice. So I'm going to put it in here. And of course, if we have this constructor, we probably we still need to do this behavior here. So I'm going to chain this, this uh, employee, this two parameter constructor to the parameter list one by using the this keyword. So that this keyword will cause this block of code in the parameter list constructor to be executed and then we'll execute the second block of code. So we're, by chaining, we avoid having to duplicate code. And uh, let's see if we could, let's see what happens with our, I've written this constructor. So shouldn't salary and hourly employee inherit from this two parameter constructor? 
And so can I do sell, can I in here, uh, just, well, notice it says, hey, salary employee doesn't have a constructor that takes two argument. But we just added a two constructor, our, a two parameter constructor to employee class. So why doesn't it show up here when we try to use it for one of the derived classes? Well, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, uh, the the um, because it could introduce some issues. Um, you child classes do not inherit the constructors of the parent class. So we would we if we want to use the parent class constructor, uh, we would need to do this. We we actually have to call it from the child class constructor. So. With hourly employee, if I wanted to, so with hourly employee, if I want to have a two class constructor, I have to actually write it in this class, but we still want to apply the dry principle and we don't want to repeat ourselves. So if I, so I'm just going to, so I could copy this from the employee class to my hourly employee class. But that would be repeating, and we don't really want to do that. So instead, what we do is we can chain to the base class with the base keyword. And we can just pass in first name, comma, last name. And do the same thing in the salary employee. And now we can see that goes away. And now we can use the, um, the two parameter constructor, but we had to write it twice, which seems less than ideal, but at least we got to use the base keyword. So we didn't have to repeat uh, the, the block of code itself for the constructor. Now, I would still like to simplify this a little bit. I'd like this hourly rate here and salary rate to be part of my constructor. So I'm going to go to salary and I'm going to add in the salary. And after it calls the base class constructor, we'll, we'll just set that into salary and uh, with the hourly we'll do the same sort of thing And so now we have a three parameter constructor, which will generate an error here, but now this, we can move. These assignment operations and we're starting to clean up our code a little bit with an use, give it, provide a nice constructor to construct our objects and it should still run. Yep. And we could provide maybe some constructor for that, but uh, really, since this is kind of, uh, you know, you don't know how many elements you're going to put in, it's probably easier just to leave the hours as a collection object that you add things to individually. 
And again, you build your constructors to provide, make it convenient for the user of your class. And so it's just some, how you structure them is uh, based on what you're doing. Um, we could probably do some things to clean up this. Here we're kind of repeating ourselves. So maybe what we'll do is we'll just chain our parameter list constructors to from to the multi-parameter ones and we'll just pass in empty strings and the default value. Same thing in our hourly employee. So we're chaining from, so now we've chained from uh, the uh, parameterless constructor to the multi-parameter constructor. Are we still working? Yes, I don't think we've called the parameterless one, but um, it should still work. So now that we know this basically works, uh, suppose we wanted to uh, to deal with this as a collection. Well, um, I'm going to add within main a list of employee. And so you can see we're making a list that's of employee, but we have an hourly and a salary employee. So we added this list class. And notice that we can, this list class is of type employee. We're going to place both an hourly and a salary employee into this list class. And so we can say my employees dot add, and we can add both a salary employee. We can also add an hourly employee. Maybe we'll do it this way so it's in the same order. It doesn't really matter, but might as well. So um, now let's say we wanted to total up the payroll for both of, for all of our employees. I'm going to create a, a decimal uh, variable and uh, set it, initialize it with a value of zero. So we've got these two employees and we want to add up their payroll. I'm going to use a for each. And uh, for each employee, E, in my employees. So what this is gonna allow us to do is because this list is a list of employees and because hourly employee and salary employee are employees, we can add both hourly and salary employee to this list of employees. We can then also, um, in a for each statement, we can extract each employee from this list into a variable which is an employee. And because salary employee and hourly employee are employees, they can be placed into E polymorphically. And so then I will say the payroll is equal, will add, uh, we need to add the pay. Well, since pay uh, has we, get, we are guaranteed that there's a pay method in every employee because the employee class has an abstract pay method. This is a contract that says if you inherit from employee, you must define a pay method and it must return a decimal. Because of that, we can 
be guaranteed that there will that we can use this pay method. And now, be, you notice that we have no errors being shown. This is all entirely possible. We have different types of employees being thrown into a collection, into one collection, not two different collections, and we can sum up the pay. So we have a list of employees. We're able to add an hourly and a salary employee to this list of employees. And when we for each through it, notice that we are able to take our hourly and salary employee and put them into this loop variable E that is itself an employee. Then because our employee class requires an, a pay method, in employee class, pay is an abstract method, and our abstract methods are, are essentially contracts that say if you impl implement employee, you must have a pay method. And because hourly and salary employee therefore both have a pay method, we can be guaranteed of that, and therefore we can make this call here within this loop that uses that pay method to sum up our payroll. Notice that we don't have to have two separate lists for hourly employee and salary employees and then add up their values. We can put them all into this one employees list polymorphically. Now, there can be many different types of employees in an organization. You could have commissioned employees, you can have commission plus salary employees, and you could define all kinds of classes off the employee class and then when it came time to calculate payroll, you'd only need this one list. So you can see the efficiency of using abstraction here and polymorphism. So let's uh, write out the um, the results of this. And let's see what we get. And yes, we get the total of these two sets of pay and it works. Uh, I'm going to reverse this. I think we should probably display the, the individual information first and then the total. And uh, just to make it a little clearer, I'll add another right, an ending right line here. And one there. Let's look at this again. So we get our two employees, and then the total. Now, let's say that uh, we didn't, let's say we wanted to do, we wanted to extract from this list the employee information. Well, what we could do is this. So we, let's, right now what we do, did is we created two employees, we showed their information and then we added everything up uh, in this list for the pay payroll polymorphically. But let's say that afterwards we wanted to go through this list of employees and display information. So I'm going to for each through for each employee e in my employees. And let's say I wanted to um, 
display the employee information. Well, one of the th nice things about um, inheritance is that uh, we have two strings defined polymorphically, or not polymorphically, but uh, that have been overridden for each employee. We see that the hourly employee is the base class two string with um, hourly employee and the salary is the same thing with salary employee. And so let's just um, let's just see what um, I'm going to extend this a little bit so that it makes it's a little more obvious what's going on. So let's just do a for each through our employees and just see what the what happens if you just dis right line that variable. And we can see that what happens is the two strings, if you just say display the object itself, the employee object in my employees, if you just display the two strings, notice that we get back the correct two string, the one that's been overridden. So our first employee was uh, Marlene, who was an hourly employee, and we can see that the correct, because the two string was overridden, the correct two string is called in each instance, even though in this instance, EMP is an employee. So why didn't it call just the employee two string, which doesn't have salary or hourly, and instead called the, uh, the correct one? Well, that's because of the override keyword. When we override a method, even if it's called polymorphically as it is here, the overridden method is what is used. So it's important to use override. Note, watch what happens if we get rid of the override keyword in our hourly employee to string and our salary employee to string. First, we get this warning that warns us that we're hiding inherited member. In this case, we're hiding the method, be, we're doing using method hiding because our to string and our salary employee uh, isn't doesn't have the override keyword. And so it will still run this method if you use it um, when, for, in a variable that is defined of employee. But watch what happens when we run it this way. And now, because emp is defined as an employee, and because the method was not overridden in the salary and hourly employee class, we get the we get the, the parent class behavior for two string. So often, especially with two string, we want to override our methods and use the override keyword. And then we get the overridden behavior, even when we are using the object polymorphically. But we let's now let's say we wanted to get the hourly rates. Well, we can't get hourly rates right now because imp is an employee. It doesn't ha an employee doesn't have an hourly rate. So how could we do that? Well. What we can do is this. We could say if employee emp is an hourly employee, then what we will say is what we want to do. What we'll do is we'll instantiate an hourly employee called. I'm going to make a slightly different variable name so I don't conflict with that one. is an employee, is emp, as hourly employee. And what this does is this casts this emp object, which is an employee, into an hourly employee. And then if we have an hourly employee, now we can use hourly emp, 
and dot. And now we have all the properties and methods of the hourly employee class. And we can get hourly rate. So I'm going to just write this out to the console. And similarly, we'll do the same sort of thing for the salary. If EMP is a salary employee, Then, um, then uh, we'll write uh, the salary to the screen. And this works because, and so what's happening here, the is operator returns true if the object on the left is of the type of the type on the right. And then what we're doing is we're casting hourly employee, we're casting emp to, the as operator can be used to cast emp to the type they want. And typically when you do this type of casting, you want to have this if check beforehand to make sure that something is of a particular type before you cast it. Now there's two ways of doing this. One is with the as operator. The other way you can do it is, is with the casting operator like this. So this is cat, and this is what I see actually more frequently, but the as operator is important to understand. Both of these will work. And so this casts EMP into a salary employee. And so let's run this. And we can see, yeah, now as we're displaying our employees, we can actually show, oh, it's an hourly employee, so we'll show the hourly rate. It's a salary employee, so we'll show the salary. So this is often termed in here unboxing, where you take an object of the parent class type and unbox it into the child class so that you can get access to the child class properties and methods. And you're frequently doing this boxing and unboxing in C sharp. Here in the list, we create a list of we created a list of employees. We create an hourly and a salary employee. And then when we added our employees, they automatically or implicitly were boxed into the employee class. So the hourly employee and the salary employee objects became employee objects. We were then able to polymorphically access them and because they all had the pay method because the employee class requires a pay method as an abstract method. We are able to use that. Then later on, down here, when we wanted to use them as hourly employees and salary employees, we were able to unbox them by first checking the type using the is operator, and then either using the as operator or the casting operator to unbox them back into the original types. So in addition to uh, inheritance from that uh, and the abstract class keyword, which we have in our employee class. Let's look at another keyword, sealed. And so I'm going to declare hourly employee as a sealed class. And uh, what does this mean? Well, I'm, let's add another class.
and we're going to call it test sealed just to give it a name and let's try to inherit from this hourly employee class now notice that we get an error it says test yield cannot derive from sealed class type hourly employee because we made hourly employee a sealed class you cannot you can't inherit from it let's another class that's that's provided from uh, the from .NET that's already sealed is a string class again if we try to inherit from string we notice that we still get we also get test sealed cannot derive from string class and that's because the string class if you go and look go to definition you notice that the string class also is an example of a class that's been sealed you can't inherit from the string class so unfortunately we can't do that so i'm just going to get rid of this sealed class and then get rid of the sealed keyword in hourly employee and that concludes my presentation on abstract uh, classes and polymorphism thank you